Washington football team fans, what is up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Bleeding B&G podcast. And guys, this is a special episode for sure. I'm here with my guy, Travis Thomas, the host of the Travis Thomas Experience. You can catch my guy weekdays, 9 a.m. to noon on the Team 980. And this is a guy I've been watching for a while, guys. So if you see that I can't contain my excitement, I'm really a fan of this guy. And we're just going to touch on some Washington football team. And we may dabble into a little bit of the Wizards. So I know a lot of you Washington football team fans are Wizards. So you guys may tune out at the end of the episode, but make sure that you listen to the quality quality Washington football team talk that we got going on for you guys right now. So Travis, how you feeling today, my guy? Holy shnikes. How was that for an intro? Great job by you. And look, you know, we were talking offline about this, but uh, let's just say we are family. Okay. That's how we got connected. We're family, man. So anytime you want me on, I got you. And I really appreciate you. Uh, I didn't realize how long you have been watching me, man. That's crazy. So I appreciate you holding me down too, man. We family for real. For sure, for sure. And always will, man. So I want to start with some background, some just some bio information. So did you actually grow up a Washington football team fan? Did you grow up in the DMV? How did that happen? So I grew up in Southern Maryland, down in St. Mary's County, about an hour and a half south of D.C. And I grew up in D.C. culture, mm -hmm. uh, you know, down there, we didn't listen to Baltimore club music. We listened to go-go, right? So I always, even though DC guys back then always called me a Bama, <laughs> now, <laughs> now I get love, but it's because, you know, I feel like I did grow up in DC, even though I didn't, because uh, like I said, we grew up with go-go and mumbo sauce and the whole nine. So um, I've always had love for DC, Maryland and Virginia. And it just so happened that my career you know, growing up where I did, I, I went to college in Baltimore. I did end up in Baltimore at Towson University. I got my degree in broadcasting from there. Started out covering the O's and the Ravens. Spent about three or four years in Baltimore and then came to D.C. And I've been there ever since. So uh, I am a local kid, uh, you know, who had this dream as a kid, literally, and grew up uh, in the area and covering all the area teams. Now, I grew up in a Washington Redskins household. However, okay. you'll love this story. My parents, when I was about seven or eight and I was really getting into football, in fact, I remember the Doug Williams Super Bowl. That's like one of my first football memories. And I don't know, I, I guess I must have started asking questions about other teams maybe. And my parents, very smart, they said, okay, look, you can like any team you want in the league. We don't care. The only team, that you will not root for, that you must hate, is a team with that star on the helmet. Absolutely. You see that team? Absolutely. I said, yeah, I see them. And they said, you hate them forever. I mm -hmm. said, no problem. So I actually grew up in a Washington household, but rooting for the 49ers. Because when I grew up, Montana and Rice, I mean, they were winning everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, most kids are front runners anyway. So I grew up following the Niners. I still do. But, uh, you know, obviously the Washington football team uh, runs in my blood quite literally and I hate the Cowboys so that automatically gives me a pass with pretty much any fan base for sure for sure we actually got a lot more in common than I thought I actually have my um, undergrad degree in broadcasting for sure so that's definitely an, an interesting tidbit to learn about yourself but you said you grew up a 49ers fan but in the 90s you know the Washington Redskins as they were called then they were pretty dominant you know they had their glory years so Travis I'm 25 I haven't seen an 11 win season what was it like around here when, you know, the Washington football team of the Redskins, as they were, were really good? Because I haven't really experienced in my lifetime. Well, I'll be 40 in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And so I'm old enough to have memories of them being good and winning Super Bowls. But I'm too young to really know what it was like around town, so to speak, and the energy. Um, I'll tell you two things. The first one you know, my producer on, on the experience, Anthony Haney's the same age as you. Mm -hmm. And we talk often about how, you know, his best Washington football team memories are watching Sean Taylor play, of course, and the RG three years and, and a couple of playoffs with Kirk. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all he has. And for me, you know, I'm kind of caught in between two generations because I'm not so OG that I have real vivid memories of the team being on top. But at the same time, I'm young enough to feel your pain, too, because I haven't really experienced a Super Bowl 
as a grown up, so to speak. Um, now, here's the second thing I'll tell you, and you'll love this story. So this will give you a glimpse into the question you just asked me. Mm -hmm. So I'm covering the Capitals during the Stanley Cup run, okay? Mm -hmm. They win the Stanley Cup. I go to the parade. My assignment that day is just to interview fans and party. That's literally what they mm -hmm. told me. I said, I'm your Huckleberry. Absolutely. So I, I, I go to the parade, and sure enough, I see Brian Mitchell. And, you know, B. Mitch and I are tight. So I walk up to him, and I swear to you, bro, he has like this like this gleam in his eyes as he's just looking over the parade. So I knew he was deep in thought and I figured he was thinking of the parade he was a part of, right? So I said, B Mitch, I said, what was it like this for y'all? And he said, nah, it wasn't like this. He said, uh, this is cool. He said, but you see that street over there? I said, yeah. See that street over there? Yeah. Then he said, see that street way down there? I said, yeah. He said they were all filled with people. Now, when we were at the Caps Parade, the streets he was pointing to, they were blocked off, you know, to keep traffic away, but they weren't filled with people. Sure. And so his point to me was, no, no, the Caps Parade was great. I went to the Nationals Parade, fantastic. But B. Mitch's point was, when the football team wins in this town, the whole city turns up. Mm -hmm. And that was really cool and a unique perspective for me who wasn't quite old enough to go to one of those back in the day. Absolutely, and that's an amazing story. Now let's touch on this current NDation of the Washington football team. So I wanna ask you, what were your prospects going into the season and what are they now after four weeks, after the first quarter of the season? God, all right, <laughs> going in, I thought nine and eight at best. Mm -hmm. but I thought they were so mediocre midland like they always are mm -hmm. that eight and nine would be the worst. Does that make sense? I literally thought they were C students. Absolutely. And what I wasn't sure of is whether or not nine and eight, eight and nine would win the division this year. Mm -hmm. I knew Dallas would be better. Um, I kind of figured Dak would play himself healthy at some point. For sure. I, I did not believe in the Eagles at all. And I thought the Giants would be right there with Washington. Mm -hmm. And now <laughs> where we're currently sitting, I have zero faith that this team wins any more games. I mean, I, I, I can't, if, think about this. If you and I did this, cause we've been trying to plan this for a while. For sure. If we had done this podcast, right before the season started, before that Chargers game. And, and you had told me in three weeks, in four weeks, the defense is gonna suck. Taylor Heineke will be carrying this team. I would have logged off of Zoom. We would have ended this thing immediately. Absolutely. Do you understand? <laughs> but yet here we are. I have no idea, bro, what's gonna happen. To be honest, Offensively, if Washington football team looks in the mirror and if the Saints look in the mirror, they see each other. Like this game to me coming up is so even because they're the same damn roller coaster teams, basically, right? But defensively, I mean, forget elite, forget even good. This this defense is is terrible. Forget, what is going on? Forget forget everything they were talking about. Forget I, I I'm speechless. I and I, I had a prediction episode in one of my earlier podcasts. I had us going, and I feel like a fool. I had us going 11 and 6 or 12 or 5. And listen, listen though. Here was my thinking. You know, we went seven and nine last year with probably the worst quarterback playing in the, in, in the NFL. And yes. I thought that, you know, we were gonna strike Fitz Magic. And I'm a season ticket holder. And I felt like a fool as soon as I saw him go down. What in the first quarter of the first game? I I I told at my next podcast episode, I told people to go burn that episode because there's no way, like you said, with because that, that same day in the Chargers game, we got exposed. We've been our defense has been exposed since week one. The, the defense got exposed. Our prized franchise acquisition quarterback, and then Curtis Samuel wasn't playing as well. So yeah, my prospects are them as well. But you mentioned Taylor Heineke. So I do want to get an honest evaluation of what you think about what he's put out in his first couple of games in the season. I have not been surprised because 
this is really what he showed us in sample sizes and in, in bite sizes. We know he, and we keep throwing this word around, but this is what he is. He's a gamer. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I have not really been surprised with anything I've seen from him. I was surprised that he got in as quickly as he did this season. I did not anticipate, I'm sure a lot of us didn't, Ryan Fitzpatrick getting hurt. I thought by the time we got around the bye week, um, you know, maybe Fitzpatrick, like he always is, could be benched and, and in comes Heineke and it could be a shot in the arm type of thing. Um, you know, so I guess from a shock perspective, I've been shocked that he got in as soon as he did this season. And I have been shocked, I will admit, in the sustainability of his play. And what I mean by that is he hasn't got banged up. Uh, he runs and he's sliding. He's not being reckless, uh, you know, diving and, and trying to take on tacklers or anything like that. I didn't know if he could flip that switch. He has. Mm -hmm. um, game after game, I'm kind of waiting for the wheels to fall off. I don't personally count the Buffalo game as like a bad game from him per se. Right. And I've defended him on my show because a lot of people said, see, this is why he's undrafted. This is why the I'm like, look. We asked this guy to bring us back from a 17-0 hole. I'm not going to blame him for throwing picks, no matter how ugly they look. We got to throw ourselves into the game. So, you know, I've been pretty surprised at his consistent playmaking ability. And I got to tell you another thing. I find myself defending him every day on my show about let's pump the brakes and slow down on this. See, we have to get a quarterback of the future thing. I mean – Let's allow this kid to play out because he is literally the only reason we're not 0-4, okay? So for me, I'm like, why hasn't he earned it? Now, I agree, he has to do it the whole season. If this team misses the playoffs, they better get close. They better have meaningful football in December and now January that it's a longer season. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, if he plays well and he has you right there, to me, he is least deserves another year definitely that and one thing I agree with um earlier in the season I was one of those we have to get our quarterback of the future but looking at so many holes that we have on the rest of this roster I agree with you 100 yes. percent to this point like our first round linebacker this year he looks like he may not pan out I don't want to I don't want to be an early skeptic but you know he's he's not showing the pro most promising start but over at Bleeding BNG, amongst the Washington football team community, we're known for our hot takes, right? So I want to get your opinion on some of the hot takes that we've put out on the Twitter sphere, over the Instagram, over the last couple of weeks. So let me know how you feel about this. So on, set, okay. on Sunday, right after the Terry McLaurin catch, I said that there aren't five better receive, five receivers in the NFL playing better than Terry McLaurin right now. How do you feel about that one? Oh, okay. Well, first of all, you worded it perfectly. Because I, I couldn't disagree. I, I can't disagree with that. That's not a hot take. I think it's an accurate take. Now, had you come out and said that there are not five wide receivers <laughs> better than Terry, we could have a discussion. Absolutely. But uh, playing better than him, I'm going to roll with you on that. Now, I'll say this. And I said this on air. And, and I could tell people were a little like, whoa, because uh, people know Santana Moss and I are really tight. That's my brother. I love him. And I would tell this to Santana to his face, but, and, and you know what? He might agree with me. I'm not sure. I haven't had a chance to talk to him about this particular topic, but I said this on air. Terry is in that rarefied air talent wise, where if this guy can stay healthy in his career, and we know that's a big if in this league, so, but if he can stay healthy in his career, I mean, I think you're talking about him among the hall of fame level wide receivers that this franchise has seen uh i i you know he's gonna be better than santana to me the modern wide receiver for for in your era and and really even in mine i caught the tail end of art monk and gary clark and those guys um but for our let's call it our era of wide receiver with this team tana to me feels like the benchmark mm -hmm. terry's gonna pass him and i, I i'm i'm just telling you uh if he could stay healthy and continue on this pace, that kid's going to have a gold jacket. We'll be talking about him in a different way than a lot of receivers who played here. Absolutely. I think the sky's the limit for Terry as well. 
And this is the one I got crucified for, so I have to run it by you. I got lambasted, any words you want to call it. After the Giants game, I said that J.D. McKissick is what we wanted Chris Thompson to be. How do you feel about that take? Oh, ho, ho, ho. That, and Travis, that one got about a thousand retweets. It's one of my most talked about tweets ever. I'm talking about replies agreeing with me, disagreeing with me. It was crazy. So how do you feel about that one? You know, I, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. My issue is not with J.D. McKissick. My issue is with they tried to force feed us Chris Thompson. For sure. And I want more J.D. McKissick. Does that make sense? I, I, don't, I don't even think this is a hot take if we get more McKissick in the offense. Absolutely. Bro, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you, between this defense – and us not having a commitment to the run, I mean, I'm going to pass out during one of these games because I'm just, I'm so ticked off because I don't understand for the life of me. I get Heineke's playing well. I get it. But why? I, I go back to the Giants game because it's off the top of my head. Heineke threw 50 times. What, what are we, what are we doing? What are we doing? We were in that game. That's not a Bills game. I mean, the fact that we don't give the ball to Gibson and McKissick more in both carries and uh, passing attempts, throwing the ball more. I, I just, our offense, in my opinion, and I, I just talked about how Terry could be a Hall of Famer, and I'm still saying this. Our offense should run through both of these backs. Absolutely. We should be in, we should be in dual running backs every G damn play. Absolutely. But instead... You know, we have to find J.D. McKissick and Antonio Gibson with microfine, uh, microfine glasses. And by the way, how about both of them making basically the top? Well, I guess McLaurin's catch was pretty crazy. But for the most part, two of the top highlighted plays of our season, McKissick with the game winner and then Gibson's effort run when we were getting blown out. So I don't know, man. It's I, I see what you're saying. I just don't even think McKissick's getting a fair chance to prove that right absolutely and somebody that drafted antonio gibson in fantasy football once again i agree with you 100 percent. and the thing that's baffling to me is we forget that the coaching staff was comparing him to christian mccaffrey and i'm not saying that he's christian mccaffrey by any means but they utilized christian mccaffrey so many ways when they were in carolina why are we doing the same with him but that's enough on the offense i really want to get your opinion on Chase Young's slow start to the season. He hasn't registered a stat in four games. Um, me personally, I don't think that he's played terrible. I've had a few issues with his post-game comments and things like that because I feel like he's talking a big game that he's not walking right now. But how do you feel about his slow start to the season? I mean, I agree with everything you said. I, I didn't love the, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to talk to guys and, <laughs> and no one better be on any BS around here. All he had to do was say, including me. That's all he had to do, and he would have been fine. He was talking like a guy who had six sacks in a game, but no one else was helping him out. Absolutely. So there needs to be some accountability there, but that's part of being a young player, I think. I think he'll figure that out. My thing, you know, there's a lot of blame for the Chase Young um, lack of production so far in the season. Obviously, you have to put a ton on Chase. I get that. He does have to play better. Let's just put that to bed now. But I think these questions of his effort and stuff like that, and he shouldn't have done family feud in the offseason and all that, I think that's noise. I think that's a bunch of BS. He needs to play better. But here's where I put some of the blame on the coaching of Chase Young and the development of Chase Young. Why, in God's name, does he not have a full toolbox of pass rushing maneuvers and moves and tactics and techniques? I don't understand how this happens. Why is this guy still just bull rushing? I, what are we doing? I mean, Absolutely. now you could say he didn't come to OTAs or he didn't this or he didn't that, but you've had him, you had him all camp. You had him, he, he came to everything mandatory. What are we doing? Right. I mean, I, I don't, so that's not all on Chase, as far as I'm concerned. And by the way, from everything I've heard on the kid, because he's so local, I know so many stories. Right. The kid's work ethic's out of this world, bro. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know people at DeMatha 
that told me when he came to DeMatha, he was a basketball dude and he was tall and skinny. He, he started playing football, obviously there. He played football all his, all his life, but he played football at DeMatha, really got into it, hit the weight room and it was a wrap. He came back the Incredible Hulk. Then when he went to Ohio State, forget about it, right? So, I mean, he has a work ethic. Where's the coaching? Where's the, the crafting of this guy? No one thought of that? I, I just don't understand it. So I think there's a lot of blame to go around, not just with Chase Young, but with the whole defense. It drives me nuts. Absolutely, absolutely. And your testaments uh, from the math, I can agree with 100% because Jared Patterson, um, he's actually a guy I've interviewed on the podcast. He's actually my little brother's best friend. So I've known Chase for a while. Those stories about them being tight, those are 100% true. And I've known Chase to always work hard and things like that. The most puzzling thing to me is this is a guy that's worked under Larry Johnson, you know, the Ohio State D-line coach, where they had, he's nurtured the Bosa's, Tom Bahali, and why doesn't he still have multiple pass rush moves? That's mo- that's probably the thing I'm most disappointed in, but like I said, I'm not going to not going to give up on Chase because I still think that he can be that generational type player that we we tagged him to be before um, he ended up in Washington. All right, so enough about that. Let's talk about the New Orleans Saints uh, matchup going into this Sunday. Um, both teams two and two. Uh, the New Orleans Saints coming off a rough game against the New York Giants, where the Giants actually got their first win of the season. We obviously coming off our victory against the Atlanta Falcons. How do you feel about our prospects for this weekend? You know, this game is going to be bizarre like the rest of them. I, I mean, just get used to it. I've been drinking more than ever watching <laughs> these games, and I plan on continuing that, to be honest. I mean, I, you know, someone, in fact, I'll tell you this, someone called the show and said, uh, how come you don't tweet more during the games? And I said, because I'm drunk watching this <laughs> crap, dude. I mean, it's, don't, it's the only way I can get through it. Right. Hey, as long Staying as you off. Absolutely. Staying off social media, bro. Um, listen, I, I, as I said earlier, these two teams are a mirror image of each other, as far as I'm concerned, at least offensively. You know, they both run the ball. Um, and then they both have quarterbacks that they just kind of, they, you know, one week they can shoot you in the foot. The next week they can make magic to win a game. And so I think both teams are trying to figure out their quarterback and they can run the ball effectively. Although I saw against the Giants, it seems like, um, you know, the Saints ran the ball effectively. They, they committed with Kamara and he had a great game. Uh, we for whatever reason, will not really fully commit to the run. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Uh, I feel like the Saints will try to just keep imposing their will with it on Sunday. So I'm actually expecting a more lower scoring game than I think most people uh, are. I I think we'll see a lot of running the ball. Um, I would give them the edge there with Kamara over our guys, although – I would give Terry uh, the edge over anyone on their roster right now at the wide receiving core, Um, you know, and then I'll be honest. I mean, right now I trust Heineke more than I do Jameis Winston. Um, So I I think in the end, it'll be more the same. I cannot bet on or continue to hold out hope for this defense. If they show up great, it's about time, but I'm not counting on it. I think we're going to see what we've been seeing, bro. I think it's going to be a close game, and we're going to hope that Heineke can pull a rabbit out of the hat yet again. And I don't – I keep saying this. I don't know how sustainable that is, but he keeps doing it, and he's going to have to do it again Sunday for the team to win. Absolutely. And two more before I get you out of here. So instead of doing a a score prediction, I know you like to dabble in a a little sports bet, and, you know, I listen to you and Slim – each morning, you know, giving out your picks and things like that. So the line stands now at Washington plus one and a half. And I think you touched base on it. I think you said it's going to be more of a low scoring game, but the over under is 44 and a half. How do you feel about those plays right there? Well, the 44 and a half is so low Mm -hmm. that I almost, my gut right now would probably be to bet the over, Mm -hmm. but I like shopping around. I mean, for anything, I don't care if it's a car or uh, avocados, I'm going to, I'm going to go and try to find the best price uh, before I spend my money. It's the same thing with sports betting. So what I'm hoping is as game time gets closer, maybe that number goes up a little bit 
and then I then I'll bet the under. But 44 is so damn low. Uh, it'll it'll be a, a little higher than that, I think. Not much. Um, you know, right now I'm thinking probably a 27, 23 ish type of game. Um, you know, I'm not sold on the Saints offense, particularly as it pertains to Jameis. I see a lot of running with Kamara. I see a, a lot of Taysom Hill. And because of that, um, maybe the defense can play a little better if they can just focus on a run game and not give up the big play over the top. Uh, the Saints right now don't really have anyone to stretch the field like that. So, you know, more than likely, it's going to be a lot of underneath stuff, a lot of stuff in the center of the field, uh, which kind of plays in the stop in the run. Um, you know, get to Jameis on your way, you know, stopping the run first should be the mentality defensively, offensively. I would love to see a lot more touches for both of these backs. I doubt it because Scott Turner hates them for some reason. Um, but I would like to see that. And then I'd like to see Heineke just handle the moments, handle third and six, handle third and seven. Uh, we need you to be special on this drive with your legs. Uh, it's the end of, you know, we're getting a two minute warning again and we're up three or four or it's a tie game. Go make something happen. Don't make the mistake. Uh, I could see a costly mistake, um, you know, from the Saints. I, I, I have more faith that Jameis will throw a pick or fumble it than, than Taylor. So uh, I'll take Washington in a tight game. I'll, right now, I'll go 27-23 officially. Got it, got it. And the last question, like I said, I've been watching you for a minute. I know Travis Thomas from Wizards Outsiders. The, the Washington Wizards are set to tip off their first preseason game in a couple of minutes. So what are your prospects about the Wizards season going into their first preseason game tonight? You know, I don't know. I, first of all, I'm not going to watch any of the preseason because I'm watching playoff baseball and I'm gambling yeah. heavily. For sure. But, um, you know, God, I had so much um, admiration and respect for Bradley Beal. And it is really hard uh for me now after that press conference the other day it really ticked me off mm -hmm. and you know not even so much everyone does have a choice he's right right like vac vaccinated or not that's fine but what i don't love is you know you talk all this game about being a leader mm -hmm. and and you know wanting to be here for the long haul and build around me and you know, they ran another guy out of town that we thought was the guy for you, right? Um, then we got Russell Westbrook in here, and, you know, it was pretty obvious to Brody that this is Brad's team. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to back home and, and play mm -hmm. with LeBron. So it, it's, it's your town, bro. Like, it's your time. They brought, they brought in Spencer Dinwiddie for you, dog. That's your friend, right? He's coming off an injury. And they still paid him and got him here and traded for him and all that. So I look at all that and I'm like, Brad says what he says. I'm like, man, I can't help but to have sort of a bad taste in my mouth about, is this guy about the franchise and the city? And is he really about all the stuff he says he is? Or is he about himself? That will be revealed this season to me. I need to see now because now you cannot use the excuse you don't have talent around you. Right. I think they did a tremendous job this offseason. They didn't put stars around him. We're not the Brooklyn Nets. I'm not, I'm not saying that, right? But he has better players around him now than he did in, last year and the year before that. Most so seen in a while. So I, I need to see. I mean, not to make this comparison, but, you know, Michael Jordan didn't become Michael Jordan until Phil Jackson said, hey, bro, you got to trust your teammates a little bit, right? So I need to see if Brad can be that guy as, the, as a one, because we've seen him be a team guy when he was playing, when he was robbing the Batman, but now you're Batman. So let's see how you handle that. And, you know, they have a coach now. I think West Sunset Jr. is going to do a tremendous job. At least we know they're going to play defense. So I want to see Brad now. I, I want to see him with the pieces, a new coach, a defensive mentality, because what he's saying doesn't tell me that he's a leader. Does that make sense? When, right. when, you, when, when you're as defiant, even, bro, even if he just said, I'm going to keep it private or I'm unvaccinated, 
and I'm not going there. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But to, to sit up there, say I'm unvaccinated and then be as defiant and as doubled down and as, uh, you know, that didn't look like a leader to me, not to me. Uh, I agree 100%, man. Travis, this was an amazing episode, guys. This is a wrap for episode 30 of the Bleeding BNG podcast. Travis, do you have any last words before we get on out of here? I do. First of all, it was an honor to be on here. Now, if I'm on on episode 30, I have got to come back for 50. Five, oh, bring me back for 50. I want the 50th episode. I'm calling it right now. No one else is doing that. I want dibs. Sure. Bring me back for 50. We're going to do it big. And in fact, I think we should cheers on the 50th. Cheers, for sure, for sure. So I got I to gotta bring the big bottles out for the 50th then, I guess. Appreciate it, man. Sure. Guys, make sure that you're tuning in into our social media pages at Bleeding BNG on Twitter, at Bleeding BNG on Instagram. You can find us on all podcast platforms and you can catch this episode on YouTube as well. Be sure to subscribe. Travis, Travis, I'll catch you on the flip side, my guy. No doubt, man. See you at the 50th. Appreciate you. See you on the 50th.